Yeah, obviously she thought she could do better. <laughs> it's interesting to see how people process a breakup though. You know, some people, their whole life shuts down when a relationship ends. You know, they're like, you don't understand, Drew. No relationship I've ever been in has ever worked out. And I'm always like, well, yeah, you know that's true of literally every currently single person, right? <laughs> I'm like trying to sympathize with you here. Like, yeah, you're in last, but you're tied with like a billion other people. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say here. <laughs> If you've ever had a friend like this, uh, you've probably had the chance to be the person who tries to like rehabilitate them and like get them back out there again, uh, which basically just is you lying to them a lot. <laughs> Honesty is not the thing they need, you know? It's just like, I don't understand, how did this happen, Drew? Yeah, obviously she thought she could do better. <laughs> I think if that weren't the case, she would still be with you. <laughs> but based on how she's not with you, it would lead me to believe that she thought she could do better than you. Does that make sense? <laughs> Whatever, I'm, I'm smart, I'm, I'm handsome, I'm, I'm charismatic. Well, yeah, but you're not maxed out in any of those things. <laughs> There's still room for improvement, all right? Uh, I wish I'd been more confident around her and been more fun. Yeah, you totally should have. Why didn't you think of that earlier? That might have worked. Whatever, I'll, I'll find someone better. Better! I don't know, because like, if I lose to my brother in a game of basketball, I'm not like, I just need to play against someone better at basketball. <laughs> you should find someone worse, you know? <laughs> play on easy mode for a bit. There's like a really key moment. I think it usually happens like in high school where you become like clothing self-aware, you know? You see a photo of yourself and then for the first time you're like, huh, so that's how those clothes always look on me. Okay. And you realize the past 16 years have just been Old Navy draped across <laughs> your lumpy body. And that's a big moment, you know? You can start to build from there. That's ground zero. It's a good moment. Uh, I've learned something about buying clothes over the years. You know how they say you should never buy groceries when you're hungry? It's the same sort of thing. You should never buy clothes when you have high self-esteem. <laughs> Don't ever do it. Maybe, maybe one day a month, I totally am the guy who can wear Nike high tops, you know? But the other 29 days, I'm not. I'm this guy, all right? It's a bad investment. I don't know, I was, I was buying shorts last summer and it must have been like a good self-esteem day because I tried on the shorts and they went down to like about here. And I was like, yeah, these look like shorts that a straight man could wear. <laughs> and they weren't. <laughs> Absolutely were not. But you don't have those thoughts when you have high self-esteem, you know? You need the low self-esteem to rein you in a bit. Because if not, you have thoughts like the one that I had, which was, yeah, they're a bit shorter than usual, but Daniel Craig wore short swim trunks in Casino Royale and no one gave him a hard time. <laughs> and, and like nothing seems wrong about that statement. Like, yeah, that's a good point. Ladies love Daniel Craig, double O heaven, 
Yes. I'll take three pairs. And then sure enough, you try them on a week later, and you're like, why are all these tiny boats on my shorts? I look like a body-positive sailor. I can't wear these with my high tops. Bad choice. What I do, I try to imagine my high school bully whenever I try on clothes. And I'm wearing the outfit, and if he leaves me alone, I can feel good about the outfit, you know? <laughs> That's the ultimate test, you know? It's like where, like, self-consciousness meets self-defense, you know? My high school bully, his name was Tyler Johnson. Uh, if that sounds like a made-up name, it's because it totally is. I'm afraid he's gonna, like, track me down, be like, Saw your special, Alan! <laughs> I'm just gonna play it safe. I don't know what his comedy preferences are, you know? But, uh... I don't know, I owe my whole fashion sense to that bully, you know? It feels weird to kind of praise a bully like that, but I don't know, sometimes you're walking around the grocery store and you see one of those guys who has like the cargo shorts with way too many pockets and that like square looking haircut and you're just like, man, that kid did not get bullied enough. <laughs> I mean, bullies do a lot of terrible things, but they do get you out of that phase, you know? It's nice to get some honest feedback once in a while. You see, I learned from a very young age that if I wore the free t-shirt I got from Chili's the night before to school the next day, Tyler Johnson was gonna twist my nipples, okay? And I'm better for that, okay? Basically, a bully's job is to say terrible things about you and make you feel bad about yourself until you're old enough to just do that naturally for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. You guys just applauded bullies. I hope you're okay with that. <clears throat> Take a look in the mirror. Wow. All right. So I am pretty nervous uh, tonight, not gonna lie. I know I seem so composed and in command of the situation right now. Uh, but I do get nervous and I've come up with like a strategy to deal with it over the years. Uh, full disclosure, it, it doesn't work. Um, it is not a good strategy, but I'll, I'll teach you, all right? So I'm a college student and We'll, we'll do a practice example. Let's say I'm about to go take a test and I'm nervous for the test. Here's what I do. I get ready and I tell myself, don't be nervous. This test doesn't even matter. <laughs> and that would be like a great place to stop. Uh, but I tend to overcorrect. I'm like, yeah, this test doesn't matter. Nothing matters. <laughs> And I mean, I, I guess it works. Like, I'm never worried about the test anymore. I don't get out of bed the next day. <laughs> but it does work. You get rid of one problem, but it's only by creating a much bigger problem. It's like you don't want to do laundry, so you set your house on fire. <laughs> guess it works. I don't know. I do, like, the same thing if I'm nervous before a date. I'm like, don't be nervous. Love is just an illusion and everyone dies alone. But sure, sure, Karen, I'll go see Zootopia with you. <laughs> then I am cool as a cucumber the rest of the way. So, yeah. I don't know. It's probably not a healthy way to deal with stress, you know? 
Some people call it an existential crisis, but I give myself existential pep talks, you know? That seems weird. I don't know what LeBron James does to get ready for a game, you know? I don't know what he has in his Beats by Dre headphones, but I'm pretty sure he's not bumping crime and punishment, you know? I am pretty sure about that. Can you imagine that post-game interview? Like, wow, LeBron, excellent performance tonight. How did you manage to stay so calm and so composed out there? Well, Doris, just try to remember that Raskolnikov killed a man and filled no guilt. <laughs> well, it certainly showed tonight, LeBron. <laughs> I don't know what's in those Beats by Dre headphones. Maybe that's what he does. I don't know. We can't be sure. I'm not nervous, though. I'm good. <laughs> Uh, like I said though, I'm a, I'm a college student right now. I'm actually about to graduate in three months. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. College is a really exciting time because, you know, it feels like you can make your life into whatever you want it to be. You can be a totally different person than you were in high school. You know, Tyler Johnson's not twisting your nipples anymore. The door is wide open. Uh, you know, you can follow your dreams and, and do what you're really passionate about. Uh, which is why I chose to study accounting for five years. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, do you ever look at your life and you're just like, Who did this? <laughs> Who thought this would be funny? Oh, I did this, that's right. <sighs> so I'm an accounting major. <laughs> uh, the program I'm in is really competitive. It's a tough program. And being in a tough business school is like being on a sinking ship where they have to like throw stuff overboard so the ship stays afloat. Except instead of throwing over excess cargo, it's all of your likes and interests. We got to get this off the ship. What's in there? Uh, feelings. <laughs> Don't have time for those this year. Just gonna have to do without. Why did we ever come aboard the USS business? We were so enticed by the exotic destination of a business park in Billings, Montana. <laughs> I don't know what one would do on the USS business if that were a real thing. Like, what's the nightly entertainment? You just get drunk and watch TED Talks? Is that what happens? <laughs> we got TED in the house tonight, I guess. <laughs> it's just the reaction I was going for. <laughs> When I tell people I'm studying accounting, there's, I usually get the same reaction. They just kind of like recoil, you know? They're like worried I'll get it on them or something. I'm like, don't worry, it's not contagious. It will kill you though. <laughs> accounting students, we know it's not cool to study accounting. It's fine, we know. We try and convince ourselves otherwise, you know? There's like not a week that goes by without one of my professors saying something like, so as you can see, accounting actually is pretty cool. <laughs> and just as a general rule of thumb, if you have to remind yourself how cool something is, it's probably not that cool. <laughs> the only time you say stuff like that is if you like accidentally hear a Wiggles song or something. And you're like, yeah, this is pretty cool, actually. Kind of got a disco bend to it, huh? You know, it's not like Bono finishes a concert and he gets all of his friends together and he's like, so as you can see, fronting the influential Irish rock band U2 is actually pretty cool. <laughs> really gives me a chance to use my creative problem solving skills. Add me on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'll be performing on the USS Business next week. Check it out. <laughs> my first day in the business school, this is a true story. I walked by a classroom and there was a professor who was giving a lecture, kind of introducing his class, and he said, ever since I was a child, I've always been passionate about quality management. <laughs> okay. 
That's what we're going with. That's the line. Ever since you were a child. So in elementary school, when kids are going around the room introducing themselves, and Timmy's like, I like comics! And Becky is like, I like ponies! You were like, boom, quality management. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> if any of you kids need some, some quality manage, just hook me up, you know? I'm a manager. It's what I do. <laughs> As I've gone through the accounting program, though, I've kind of felt more and more like comedy is what I want to do with my life. You know, I don't want it to be just a hobby. And that's not like a joyous realization that a person has, you know? It's like when Harry Potter tries on the sorting hat and he's just like, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. That's my attitude towards comedy, really. It's not, you know, like you don't tell your parents you're planning on doing comedy without like really preparing them before you tell them that. I was like, listen guys, I felt this way for a long time and this is something I feel I've always known about myself. Like, it's fine, we saw the shorts, we know. <laughs> One step ahead of you there. Like, no, nothing. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. Realizing that you want to pursue a career in comedy, that's like taking like years of self-reflection and you wake up one day and you realize that the only thing that will make you happy in life is being a Cleveland Browns fan. <laughs> you know, like, you know the next couple of years are gonna be pretty rough, you know? <laughs> it's gonna be like at least 15 years before anything good might happen to you, you know? At the very earliest, you know? You don't think it's, I don't know. Comedy as a career, wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Probably, is it as bad as being a Browns fan? I don't know, who's to say? Do any of you know who Dave Logan is? The iconic Cleveland Browns player? No, your team plays in Cleveland, all right? A city whose greatest cultural achievement is the Drew Carey show. All right, your logo is a brown helmet, all right? You can't even put the logo on your helmet because it would create this infinite sequence of helmets inside of helmets. I wouldn't wish this life on my worst enemy, you know? But now, uh, I tell my fellow accounting students that I'm thinking about pursuing a career in comedy, and that gets the room quiet really quickly. You know? You know, everyone else talks about where they're gonna work when they graduate, and they're like, Deloitte, KPMG, Goldman, and I'm like, comedy writing! You know, and they're like, oh, what's, what's the starting salary on that? Zero. Zero dollars? Yeah, well, any currency, really. <laughs> Take your pick. How about you, what are you gonna study? What are you gonna work in? Quality management. <laughs> it's a good career. That's fair. I'm looking for a job right now, though. You know, something to, something to pay the rent while I pursue a career being a Cleveland Browns fan. <laughs> uh, it's hard to find a job, though. There's a lot of things that suck about it. You know, resumes, filling out cover letters, thinking you're dead. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> I'll explain myself. So, a couple summers back, I was in high school and I'm looking for just like a crappy summer job, you know, something to just hold me over. And you have like the jobs you want, and then you have like, like the subway tier, I call it. It works on two levels because subways are below the ground and because the restaurant subway is not a place you want to work. <laughs> Why it's called the subway tier. Anyway, I like, I didn't hear back from any of these places and like, after a week of not hearing back from Pizza Pie Cafe, there's some part of you... <laughs> there's some part of you that really wants to believe that this is all just like a weird sixth sense thing that's happening, you know? You've actually been dead for a month. <laughs> 
I actually had a thought cross my mind this summer when I was like, well, maybe something just killed me and I didn't notice, you know? Like, thinking I was dead was easier for me to accept than the fact that Pizza Pie Cafe did not want to interview me, even. <laughs> it's not a good feeling. A lot of the jobs I applied for that summer, though, uh, they have you fill out these quizzes, uh, and they always tell you the same thing. There are no wrong answers. Which, why are we taking this then? <laughs> That's, well, look, another perfect score. <laughs> it's, uh, an impressive batch here, huh? They always ask you questions, you know, like, an employee or a customer pays you too much money. Do you keep the change for yourself or do you go give it back to them? And obviously they want you to say you're going to give the money back, right? The weird thing though is one of the quizzes I was taking, instead of giving me like a right answer and a wrong answer, they just gave me two wrong answers. <laughs> there was no longer any right choice. So they're just like, do you steal money from the register or do you blame it on your coworker? <laughs> Hold on, I don't want to do either of those things, okay? <laughs> Surely there must be a right choice here. I feel like the hiring manager must have been watching Breaking Bad or something when <laughs> they wrote this quiz. So, all right, the feds are hot on your tail, all right? Do you take the money and leave your family or do you shoot the cop? <laughs> I did not know there was so much moral ambiguity to making a pizza. Listen up, kid. This is the real world, okay? This is Pizza Pie Cafe. <laughs> Things ain't so black and white out here. Sometimes you can't tell where the cheese stops and the pepperoni begins. <laughs> we need an employee who's not afraid to make the hard choices and step on some throats. <laughs> it seriously felt like they were just gonna bring me into the interview and like hand me a gun and there's like an old lady tied up in there. <laughs> Finish the job! You said you'd do anything to get this job, now prove it! So I killed her. Damn. Didn't get the job, though. Not enough experience, I guess. Experience of hiding old ladies' bodies in pizza dough. <laughs> oh well, you live and learn. So yeah, looking for a job. I did find an apartment though. Uh, it's a really nice place. I'm really happy with where I'm living now. Uh, and I actually got to live there by myself for about a month. I had a month before my roommates moved in and just had the place to myself. And it turns out that you learn a lot about yourself when you live alone in like a very short, concentrated amount of time. So I learned I still totally believe in ghosts. <laughs> like, like very much so. I always thought of myself as like a very rational person, you know. I don't just project you know, superstition onto things I don't understand. Yeah, that lasted a day. <laughs> when you live alone, your life turns into the Blair Witch Project, all right? <laughs> you see the world in grainy found footage. <laughs> and you're always late to stuff, because any time you need to, like, go downstairs or cross a corner, it's stretched out for, like, three minutes. <laughs> Takes way longer than it should. I don't know. On one hand, I totally get it. There are no ghosts. We all know that. But when it's like midnight in your apartment and your pipes are creaking and you don't understand why, or you walk by your TV and it crackles and it just goes, six days left! <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> we may never understand. So yeah, ghosts are real. I'm also... I also found out I get really paranoid when I live alone. Like, every single person I see in the street is just waiting to rob me. <laughs> Which, like, 
believing that a burglar wants to like rob a 24 year old's apartment that's like much more unreasonable than believing in ghosts <laughs> yeah. Like, what's he gonna, what, what Ocean's Eleven heist are they planning for my apartment, you know? We hear he just got a new toaster for Christmas. It's got three slots in it. Are they gonna take my Abbey Road poster, you know? It's gonna run off. It's just so well sequenced. Each track is so strong. Just runs off with a poster. No, all right? But that's how I feel. The other weird thing about where I live, there's like lots of kids uh, in the neighborhood where I live, which is a whole weird thing. I found I'm actually really awkward around kids, particularly when their parents are around. Because like, hear me out, all right? Like, you wanna seem nice, but not like too nice. Just like some time in the last year, I rounded this corner where I'm no longer the one in danger, in stranger danger. <laughs> and that's a weird feeling. It's a very sudden realization you have, you know? We've swapped positions in the van. So now I'm always like way weird around kids when their parents are around, you know? Because it's hard to just kind of like casually slip into a conversation that you don't want to kidnap them, you know? <laughs> hard to just slide it on in, you know? So I'll be like out in the street walking home and I'll see a kid and I'm like, oh hey, did you hear about the new Zelda game? Yeah, it looks really good. I'd totally rather steal that than an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> Then like the mom walks over and I'm like, oh, hey. And she's like, you want to play catch with Timmy? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm just going to watch. No, I'm not going to watch. Not. I don't even own binoculars. <laughs> it's a weird feeling. That's all. So I don't know. I'm like, right now I'm just trying to get my life in order for after I graduate, you know, try to find a job find a place to live and, you know, I just want to make my life into what I want it to be, which is oftentimes hard to do, you know? Like, I just, it's easy to say stuff like, you know, I want to be in a healthy relationship and date people, but doing that is like a whole different thing. I had a bowling date last week, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah. I know, you're like, bowling, yeah, pretty lame. I told you right up front, this is a man who's run out of ideas, okay? <laughs> we, we knew that going into this. But what can I say? Every, it happens, like, once a year, you just get this urge to, and you're just like, I must bowl! <laughs> I don't know where it comes from, but there's, there's, like, some primal thing to bowling. It just feels good, you know? So why not make a date out of it, you know? I don't know if like our ancestors, this is like an evolutionary thing where our ancestors protected themselves by like rolling stones at enemy tribes or something. And that's why it's so good. Can you imagine? Like, Chief, a pack of wolves is approaching us. How many of them are there? 10 by the looks of it. I think if we hit the center one, it can hit all of the other wolves as well. I don't know where it comes from, all right? I just know I like to bowl sometimes. <laughs> so we were on this bowling date, and here's the thing with bowling dates. There's only like this weird five second window for you to interact with the other person <laughs> after, after you throw the ball. And there's really not much to comment on. And the, Usually it's just like whatever just happened with the ball you threw, which in my case is usually like, oh, seven, that's kind of good, but not that good, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> and it's hard to come up with 10 frames of that, you know? <laughs> not easy. 
Uh, the girl I was on this date with, though, she was, she was very bad at bowling. And there's, there's like an interesting spectrum with bowling where it's kind of like, ah, ah, shucks, cute. But then you cross like a certain point. And it just becomes like genuinely concerning. Because I, I honestly don't know how you live to the age of 24 while only bowling a 24, you know? I don't know. Like, I get it. On one hand, bowling is a sport. It's fine if you're not good at it. But on the other hand, I also feel like it's just kind of a basic life skill. You know? If you're pouring a glass of milk, it's not okay if all of a sudden you're like, Whoa! Sorry, I don't know what happened. Can you show me? Am I doing this right? How do you hold it? It's not okay if you're like driving a car to just veer off into the other lane. We're not like, oh, it's fine. We'll just put up medians. We'll put up medians. Would that help at all? All I'm saying is if you can't bowl like a 75 or higher consistently, Maybe Earth isn't the place for you. And for some reason, she got really upset when I told her that. I don't know. I tend to get, like, really attached really quickly when I date someone. That's kind of like my go-to move. <laughs> That's my thing. And people always say it's a bad idea. You know, they're like, you know, only fools rush in. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Which is fine, but like, where else do you want me to put my eggs, man? <laughs> right? Where else if not this basket? And do I look like the guy who has like an abundance of other baskets available to him? gotta put them somewhere. Have you tried carrying around a bunch of eggs? They just fall everywhere. You have to put them in a basket. Just looking for somewhere to put my eggs. It's actually what my Tinder bio says. It's just... Put those eggs somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes getting attached like that gets me into trouble. Uh, I had, there was this one time I had a really good date with this girl, so I got home and I was like, I'm gonna look at her Spotify profile. <laughs> it's an important step because when I look at her Spotify, I get to see if we share the same taste in music or if I need to start the process of convincing myself that I like her music. <laughs> and I can do either one, I have no preference. I've done both many times before. But I'm going through her profile on Spotify and I see she has an entire Bruce Springsteen playlist. And Bruce, one of my all-time favorite artists, and I start freaking out, I'm like, she's the one. But then I scroll up, and I notice it's actually her dad's playlist that she's just following. And it's like, oh, what do I do with those feelings I just had? Do I just love her dad? Is that, is that what's going on here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, though, it's, it's always cool to me when... Uh, you know, from a very early point in a relationship, someone knows that it's gonna work out, you know? Every once in a while, you'll like, see a guy at a wedding and he'll pull out this note and he'll be like, I wrote this note the very first day I met you. And he reads it off and it's super romantic and it's great. But then at the same time, you also know that for like every guy like that, there's like eight other guys who wrote that same note and then just totally got dumped. <laughs> And they're just like, do I keep this note now? Like, what if, I guess if we could get back together, then it'd be a cool story. Like, I almost threw this note away. 
<laughs> it makes a great writing sample. <laughs> well, well written. <laughs> I don't know though, like if, what do you do in that situation? Do you throw away that stuff or do you just like keep it forever with the hope that things will work out, you know? Is that how you become a hoarder? <laughs> Maybe hoarders are just the most romantic people ever, you know? <laughs> the only difference is they keep those notes forever, you know? It was like, as soon as I met you, I never wanted to forget a single day. So I started collecting every single newspaper from every day for the last 20 years. So romantic. I don't know. If you get dumped, I say you keep the note. I think it's a great souvenir. It's basically the romantic equivalent of like one of those Super Bowl t-shirts they make for the losing team. <laughs> it's a great souvenir. That's all. Keep it. But it's weird. Sometimes you think you know where you're at in a relationship and it turns out you were totally wrong. You just misread the situation. It's happened to me before. It's even happened in situations that have nothing to do with dating. So I worked as a secretary a couple summers back for uh, just this office. And uh, one of my duties as secretary was to water plants in the office. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, oh, that sounds much more like a custodian than a secretary. <laughs> it was a small office. We wore lots of different hats, all right? <laughs> and the other hat I wore was gloves, all right? <laughs> So I watered these plants every day, and uh, there were five of them. By the time I finished, four of the plants were doing pretty well, but one of them was just so vibrant and so green, and it was my favorite plant the whole time I worked there. So my last day in the office, I was talking to my boss, and I was like, whoever comes in after me better make sure to take care of that plant, because it's my favorite. I always gave it extra water, and it's my favorite. <laughs> And my boss looks at me and is like, Drew, that plant is made of plastic. I water that plant every day for four months. I was convinced it was growing. Right? And this was the first time I ever witnessed like my whole dating life flash before my eyes in the form of a plant. I thought we had something special. I made that plant like three mix CDs. I thought it was different from all the other plants. Which I guess it was in the sense that it wasn't actually a plant. Now I just feel like I can't trust plants anymore, you know? To this day though, I still don't understand. Where did the water go? There's no water there. I didn't make it up. What we had was real. I'm not much better at, at processing a breakup though, you know. I just get like really emotional in random spots sometimes, you know, like a grocery store or like watching a movie or watching the 2016 film Central Intelligence at your apartment, you know. Why could Kevin Hart and Dwayne The Rock Johnson make it work, but not me? They were polar opposites. And they found a way. No, the weirdest place I've ever had just like a random emotional breakdown was at a Craig's Cuts. <laughs> Craig's Cuts is where I go to get my hair cut. If it sounds like a high class quality establishment, it's because it is. <laughs> True. Do they give haircuts below $10 there? No. It depends on what day of the week you go, okay? <laughs> Quality stuff. Anyway, I was at Craig's Cuts, and they were offering a scalp massage the day that I went. And uh, if you've never had a scalp massage before, just kind of, if you go like this, this is a pretty good preview. Maybe you think there's like a special technique to it. No, it's just Denise going like this. <laughs> but uh, 
I took him up on the free scalp massage. How could you pass it up, right? And I'm sitting there, and Denise starts up, you know, and I'm like, oh, this is nice. I like this. I missed this. <laughs> And then just this crushing wave of sadness just washes over me, just hits me like a wrecking ball, you know? I came in like a scalp massage. <laughs> Any other place you have just like a random breakdown, at least you can like duck out of the way, you know, get some privacy. But in Craig's Cuts, you're like strapped into your chair, forced to like stare in the mirror as your face slowly changes. Just... <laughs> Denise is like, everything all right? I'm like, yeah, I just got hair in my eyes. <laughs> I haven't started cutting your hair yet. <laughs> That's right, because of the, the scalp massage. <laughs> but then you just go home and cry watching Central Intelligence. That's what happens. <laughs> We've all been there before. You know? <laughs> this feels like a key time in my life, right before I graduate. You know, I'm about to graduate, be out there in the real world, be an adult, and I want to get things right, you know? I want, to, I want to have the life that's right for me, and I want to be like a real adult. And so, right before this last semester started, I kind of took part in this, like, symbolic gesture that to me was going to symbolize the start of my adult life. I bought a messenger bag. That was, that was the day my adult life started. <laughs> when I mounted that single strap around my shoulder. Because you really can't be taken too seriously with a backpack, you know, just as a rule of thumb. But to me, this messenger bag was a huge symbolic moment. And to be fair, other symbolic moments I've had in my life, there's really only one. It was when I started parting my hair in this direction instead of the other. <laughs> So that's the bar I'm working with here, you know? It felt like a big moment to me. And so, uh, about a month ago, I had my last first day of class. I started my last semester, and you know, got my clothes all laid out, I brushed my teeth, I shaved, and then I put on my messenger bag and I was ready. And I get my laptop out and my books and I'm gonna load them up. And none of them fit in the messenger bag! <laughs> This is how I start my adult life. <laughs> how was I supposed to know? There wasn't a sample textbook at J. Crew for me to shove in there. <laughs> now I just look like the goof walking around campus with a half-empty messenger bag and three textbooks under his arm. All right, look out, world, here I come! All right, you guys, you've been an awesome audience. That's my time. Thank you so much.